Hello everyone, today I wanted to make a video on Objections to Premillennialism by Louis Burkhoff. And I'm going to be reading from his Systematic Theology. And when he uh, references verses, we're going to look them up in uh, eSword software so we can read all those references uh, he is making. Alright, so let's begin. In the discussion of the Second Advent, the premillennial view of it was already subjected to special scrutiny and criticism, and the succeeding chapters on the resurrection and the final judgment will offer further occasion for a critical consideration of the premillennial construction of these events. Hence, the objections raised at this point will be of a more general nature, and even so, we can only pay attention to some of the most important ones. A. The theory is based on a literal interpretation of the prophetic delineations of the future of Israel and the kingdom of God, which is entirely untenable. This has been pointed out repeatedly in such works on prophecy as those of Fairbairn, Rehm, and Davidson, in the splendid work of David Brown on the Second Advent. In Walda Grave's important volume on New Testament Millennialism, and in the more recent works of Dr. Alechts on De Prophete des Oude Verbonds and Het Herstel van Israel volgens het Oude Testament. The last volume is devoted entirely to a detailed exegetical study of all the New Testament passages that might bear in any way on a future restoration of Israel. It is a thorough work that deserves careful study. Premillenarians maintain that nothing short of a literal interpretation and fulfillment will satisfy the requirements of these prophetic forecasts. But the books of the prophets themselves already contain indications that point to a spiritual fulfillment. Isaiah 54 verse 13. Let's go there. 54:13. See Isaiah fifty four thirteen. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be that peace of thy children. And chapter sixty one verse six. Sixty one verse six. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Next, let's go to Jeremiah 3.16. Jeremiah 3.16. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Jeremiah 31 Verses 31 through 34. Let's go there. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and, the ho and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, 
and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Next, let's look at Hosea 14, verse 2. 14, verse 2. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. And lastly, Micah, verse... Verses 6 through 8 of chapter 6. 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with uh, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The contention that the names Zion and Jerusalem are never used by the prophets in any other than a literal sense, that the former always denotes a mountain and the latter a city, is clearly contrary to the fact. To fact, There are passages in which both names are employed to de designate Israel, the Old Testament Church of God. Isaiah 49 verse 14 14. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Isaiah 51, verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. Chapter 52, verses 1 and 2. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For thenceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And this use of the terms passes right over into the New Testament. Galatians 4.26. Let's go there. Galatians 4.26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews twelve twenty two. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. 
And lastly, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Chapter 21, verse 9. Oops. Let's go back. 21, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will shew thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It is remarkable that the New Testament, which is the fulfillment of the Old, contains no indication whatsoever of the reestablishment of the Old Testament theocracy by Jesus, nor a single undisputed positive prediction of its restoration, while it does contain abundant indications of the spiritual fulfillment of the promises given to Israel. Matthew twenty one forty three. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Acts 2, 29-36 Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would rise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the hosts of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 15, verses 14 through 18. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world.
Romans 9, 25, and 26. Oops, 9, 25. As he saith also in Aussie, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 13. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to, to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. First Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had, had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Revelation 1 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation 5 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. For further details on the spiritualization found in Scripture, the work of Dr. Weingarten on the future of the kingdom may be consulted. The New Testament certainly does not favor the literalism of the premillenarians. Moreover, this literalism lands them in all kinds of absurdities, for it involves the future restoration of all the former historical conditions of Israel's life. The great world powers of the Old Testament, Egyptians, Assyrians, and Babylonians, and the neighboring nations of Israel, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and Philistines must again appear on the scene. Isaiah 11.14 11.14 But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the east. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Amos 9.12 
almost 912. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Joel 319. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Micah 5, verses 5 and 6. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian, when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. Revelation 18 Yeah, I'm not going to read the, the entire chapter, but you you can read it for yourself. It it talks about the uh, the fall of Babylon, as you can see. The temple will have to be rebuilt. Isaiah 2 Verses 2 and 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let, a, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Let's go there. Micah. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to, to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 22. That was Zechariah, yep. Twenty-two. There is no Zechariah 14.22. Uh, so let's just read till 21 then. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain, there shall be plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that can come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, 
and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowels before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seeth therein. And in that day there shall be no more uh, the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Also, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, apparently. The sons of Zadok will again have to serve as priests. Ezekiel 44, verses 15 through 41. Ezekiel 44. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with inner linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, while less they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and shall have linen breeches upon their loins, and shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go forth into the other court, even into the other court of the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered, and lay them into the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments. And they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pall their heads. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. Neither shall they take of their wives a widow, nor her that is put away. But they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow, that had a priest before, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves, but for father, or for mother, or for son, or for daughter, or brother, for brother, or for sister that hath had no husband, they may defile themselves. And after he is cleansed, they may reckon unto him seven days. And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary, unto the inner court, the minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God, and it shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance, and ye shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession, and they shall eat the meat offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs and the first of all their first fruits, of all things, and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations, shall be the priests. Ye also, ye shall also give unto the priests the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to the rest of thine house. The priests shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself, or torn, whether it be foul, or a beast.
again there is no verse 41 so I'm just gonna stop here at verse 31 and Ezekiel chapter 48 verses 11 through 14 It shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And this oblation of the land that is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. And over against the border of the priests the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand, and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the firstfruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. And even sin and trespass offerings will again have to be brought upon the altar, not for commemoration, as some premillennianarians would have it, but for atonement. Ezekiel 42:13, and of course this is heresy for uh, Christ is our atonement. 42:13. Let's go there. Then said he unto me, The north chambers and the south chambers, which are before the separate place, they be holy chambers, where the priests that approach unto the Lord shall eat the most holy things. There shall lay the most holy things, and the meat offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. And Ezekiel 43, verses 18 through 27. And he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it, to offer burnt offerings thereon and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests the Levites that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me, to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock for a sin offering. And thou shalt take of the blood thereof, and put it on the four horns of it, and on the four corners of the settle, and upon the border round about. Thus sh uh, shalt thou cleanse and purge it, Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering, and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. And on the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering, and they shall cleanse the altar, as they did cleanse it with the bullock. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish, and a ram out of the flock without blemish. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priests shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shalt they purge the altar and purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day, and so forward, the priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar, and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord God. And in addition to all that, the altered situation would make it necessary for all the nations to visit Jerusalem from year to year in order to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And even from week to week to worship before Jehovah. Isaiah 66 verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. B. The so-called postponement theory, which is a necessary link in the premillennial scheme, is devoid of all scriptural basis. According to it, John and Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom, that is, the Jewish theocracy, was at hand. But because the Jews did not repent and believe, Jesus postponed its establishment until his second coming. The pivotal point marking the change is placed by Schofield in Matthew 11.20, by others in Matthew 12, and by others still later. Before that turning point, Jesus did not concern himself with the Gentiles but preached the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. And after that, he did not preach the kingdom anymore, but only predicted its future coming and offered rest to the weary of both Israel and the Gentiles. But it cannot be maintained that Jesus did not concern himself with the Gentiles before the supposed turning point. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13. Let's go there. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter dar darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, show, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. John 4, verses 1 through 44, 42. Now, I'm not going to read this entire chapter, but uh, it's a bit, a bit long to, to read here, but... Um, you, you all probably know the story and you can read it if you don't but it's uh, it's about Jesus and the woman of Samaria nor that after it he ceased to preach the kingdom Matthew 13 so let's go there Matthew 13 Again, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but you can read it for yourself if you want. But uh, here, of course, he, he preaches the parables of the kingdom of heaven. A lot 
lot of different parables here. All right, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Let's go there. All right. After these things, the Lord appointed others seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and pl place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to the, this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Again, this is pretty clear here. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of, that, of, of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. There is absolutely no proof that Jesus preached two different gospels. First, the gospel of the kingdom, and then the gospel of the grace of God. In the light of scripture, this distinction is untenable. Jesus never had in mind the reestablishment of the Old Testament theocracy, but the introduction of the spiritual reality of which the Old Testament kingdom was but a type. Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, verses 31 and 33. Let's go there. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the, is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown... It is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took, and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Chapter twenty one forty three. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. 
Next, let's turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. John 3.3 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 18, verses 36 and 37. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, for every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Compare with Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He did not postpone the task for which he had come into the world, but actually established the kingdom and referred to it more than once as a present reality. Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I love that verse. It's a very good verse. Matthew twelve twenty eight. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And we just read John eighteen thirty six and 37. So let's compare that with Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? This whole postponement theory is a comparatively recent fiction, and is very objectionable, because it breaks up the unity of Scripture and of the people of God in an unwarranted way. The Bible represents the relation between the Old Testament and the New Testament as that of a type and antitype, of prophecy and fulfillment. But this theory holds that, while the New Testament was originally meant to be a fulfillment of the Old, it really became something quite different. The kingdom, that is, the Old Testament, theocracy, was predicted and was not re restored, and the church was not predicted, but was established. Thus, the two fall apart, and the one becomes the book of the kingdom, and the other, with the exception of the gospels, the book of the church. Besides, we get two peoples of God, the one naturally, and the other spiritual, the one earthly, and the other heavenly. As if Jesus did not speak of quote, one flock and one shepherd, end quote. John ten sixteen. 
and as if Paul did not say that the Gentiles were grafted into the old olive tree. Romans 11:17. Let's go there. And if some of the branches were broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. See, this theory is also in flagrant opposition to the scriptural representation of the great events of the future, namely the resurrection, the final judgment, and the end of the world. As was shown in the preceding, the Bible represents these great events as synchronizing. There is not the slightest indication that they are separated by a thousand years, except this be found in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. So let's go there, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, nor in their hands, as they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, of course, there are different interpretations of what uh, the, the thousand years in Revelation 20 mean. The dispensational uh, list will say Christ came before the thousand years, and then he physically rules on earth for a thousand years. But uh, Bob Inc. And, and most Reformed would uh, take the position that uh, we are in the Millennium Kingdom right now. And he is ruling and reigning as we speak. And this is not a literal 1,000 years, but a spiritual one. Of course, you also have the post-millennialists. Uh, but uh, that that's, uh, gets a bit off topic, so let's go back. They clearly coincide. Matthew 13, verses 37 through 43. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sow them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And verses 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea 
and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Separation of the good and the evil at the end, not a thousand years before. Very good point here. Chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. From one end of heaven to the other. Chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. Forty-six. Again, this is a pretty long text here, so I'm not going to be reading it on uh, in the video just to keep the video a little bit shorter. But uh, it talks about the final judgment, as you can see, and you can of course read it for yourself if you want to. John five twenty-five through twenty-nine. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Again, um, you can't really see that there's a, a, a gap of 1,000 years you know, in between this. Uh, that that's a very weird uh, interpretation, I think. First Corinthians fifteen verses twenty two through twenty six. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man is his own order. Christ the first fruits after they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Again, this is you, you can't see really a 1,000 year gap here, you know. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in, it, in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They all occur at the coming of the Lord, which is also the day of the Lord. In answer to this objection, Premillenarians often suggest that the day of the Lord may be a thousand years long, so that the resurrection of the saints and the judgment of the nations takes place in the morning of that long day, and the resurrection of the wicked and the last judgment at the great white throne occurs in the evening of that same day. They appeal to Second Peter 3.8, quote-unquote, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, end quote. But this can hardly prove the point, for the tables might easily be turned here. The same passage might also be used to prove that the thousand years of Revelation 20 are but a single day. Yeah, so that, that doesn't work. <laughs> D. There is no positive scriptural foundation whatsoever for a premillennial view of a double or even a three or fourfold resurrection as their theory requires, nor for uh, spreading the last judgment over a period of a thousand years by dividing it into three judgments. It is, to say the least, very dubious that the words, quote unquote, this is the first resurrection, end quote, in Revelation 20, verse 5, refer to a physical resurrection. The context does not necessitate nor even favor this view. What might seem to favor the theory of a double resurrection is the fact that the apostles often speak of the resurrection of believers only and do not refer to that of the wicked at all. But this is due to the fact that they are writing to the churches of Jesus Christ, to the connections in which they bring up the subject of the resurrection, and to the fact that they desire to stress the soteriological aspect of it. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go there. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than, than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether I were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and ye are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. But if the dead rise not, then Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subjected unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If, after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me, if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness, and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die, and that which thou sowest thou sowest not, that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may 
chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, and one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit corruption, incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words.
Other passages clearly speak of the resurrection of the righteous and that of the wicked in a single breath. Daniel 12, verse 2. Let's go there. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. John 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Acts 24.15 And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. We shall consider this matter further in the following chapter. E. The premillennial theory entangles itself in all kinds of insuperable difficulties with its doctrine of the millennium. It is impossible to understand how a part of the old earth and of sinful humanity can exist alongside of a part of the new earth and of a humanity that is glorified. How can perfect saints and glorified bodies have communion with sinners in the flesh? How can glorified saints live in this uh, sin-laden atmosphere and amid scenes of death and decay. How can the Lord of glory, the glorified Christ, establish his throne on earth as long as it is not yet being re renewed? The 21st chapter of Revelation informs us that God and the church of the redeemed will take up their dwelling place on earth after heaven and earth have been renewed. How then can it be maintained that Christ and the saints will dwell there a thousand years before this renewal? How will sinners and saints in the flesh be able to stand in the presence of the glorified Christ, seeing that even Paul and John were completely overwhelmed by the vision of him? Acts 26 verses 12 through 14. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Revelation 1.17 And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Beat truly says, quote unquote, We cannot conceive mingled together on the same planet some who have yet to die and others who have passed through death and will die no more. Such confusion of the present age with the age to come is in the last degree unlikely." Unquote. The Last Things, page 88. And Brown calls out, quote, What a mongrel state of things is this, 
what an abhorred mixture of things totally inconsistent with each other. End quote. The Second Advent, page 384. F. The only scriptural basis for this theory is Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. After an Old Testament content has been poured into this, this is a very precarious basis for various reasons. 1. This passage occurs in a highly symbolical book and is admittedly very obscure, as may be inferred from the different interpretations of it. 2. The literal interpretation of this passage, as given by the premillenarians, leads to a view that finds no support elsewhere in Scripture, but is even contradicted by the rest of the New Testament. This is a fatal objection. Sound exegesis requires that the obscure passages of Scripture be read in the light of the clearer ones, and not vice versa. 3. Even the literal interpretation of the premillenarians is not consistently literal, for it makes the chain in verse 1 and consequently also the binding of verse 2 figurative, also conceives of the thousand years as a long but undefined period, and changes the souls of verse 4 into resurrection saints. 4. The passage, strictly speaking, does not say that the classes referred to, the martyr saints and those who did not worship the beast, were raised up from the dead, but simply that they lived and reigned with Christ. And this living and reigning with Christ is said to constitute the first resurrection. 5. There is absolutely no indication in these verses that Christ and his saints are seen ruling on the earth in the light of such passages as Revelation 4.4. 4. Let's go there. Four, four. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Revelation 6 9, go there. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. It is far more likely that the scene is laid in heaven. 6. It also deserves notice that the passage makes no mention whatsoever of Palestine, of Jerusalem, of the temple, and of the Jews, the natural citizens of the millennial kingdom. There is not a single hint that these are in any way concerned with this reign of a thousand years. For a detailed interpretation of this passage from the amillennial point of view, we refer to Kuiper, Bavink, the Moor, Dyke, Kreidanus, Voss, and Hendrickson. Well, I uh, hope this was a blessing to you all. I hope this convinced you that the premillennial position is clearly uh, flawed. And I hope, I hope you will look into the uh, millennial point of view, as we just read in the last sentence here. Well, I hope you all enjoyed, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.